I agree with um, perhaps 75% of what Nick said. I was very heartened to hear about the uh, compliance rates. If those are valid, that's very good news and, and it's consistent with what I'm going to be telling you. I don't agree, but I haven't got time to discuss it except in discussions uh, about the uh, preference for disciplinary repositories over non-disciplinary repositories. And I think the, the prestige question is a complete red herring. The, the, value of a publication is and always has been uh, the quality level of the journal in which it's published, not the repository in which it's deposited. But anyway, that's a different story. Now, I'm going to, this is a meeting about open science. And like Nick, I am not going to discuss open science here. But I'll give a reason why I don't discuss open science. It's premature. Open access, as I'll describe it here, is a precondition for open science. And we do not have open access now. The happy figures that you've been hearing about ERC compliance and that you'll hear about uh, uh, institutional mandate uh, compliance are exceptions. Overall, the percentage of research that is open access now is lamentably low. Somewhere, the optimistic uh, estimates are somewhere about 35 or 40 percent. It's probably less than that in many disciplines. That's not open access, and you can't have open access while uh, that's not that's right. You can't have open science while you only have 30 to 35 percent of the uh, of the science accessible to uh, all users. So I'm going to be talking about the prerequisite for open science, which is open access. And for that, it's important even to settle on what open access is. What we've been doing, and we're still doing and I think Cameron's talk after me will be doing it as well, is overreaching. <clears throat> you see over there, somebody's reaching for a fruit that's out of reach, and right by him on the left is a, is a big fruit that he's not grasping that is within reach. I'm talking about that big root fruit, except it's the wrong color. Over there it looks like it's orange or gold, and the fruit I'm talking about is green, and I completely agree with, uh, with uh, Nick's uh, concerns about open access, but I want to also say, that the concerns with open with gold open access that Nick has are about what I've come to call fool's gold open access, which is the gold open access that it is accessible now, but it's not the gold open access that will be accessible after green open access has prevailed. Um, Nick is is uh, is uh, uh, optimistic that for framework for for uh, for Horizon 2020 it'll reach 100%. Let's, from, from your lips to God's ears, uh, about that. But um, we need that first. And we need it globally, not just in the European com com community, but globally. Until then, we can't speak about journals, which are uh, global journals. They're not just UK journals or, or European journals. They're, they're journals for the entire world. You can't <coughs> speak about them converting from subscription to fair gold, as opposed to fool's gold, until we have first global green open access, and that's what I'm here to talk about, how to reach global green open access. Now, I'll take a step backwards. I'll pretend, and I'm probably not pretending, because many of you use the word open access and open science, but if your life depended on defining it, you wouldn't be able to do it. So, what made open access possible? It's the internet itself. What Nick said about online uh, about the day when uh, journals are online only, in a sense we're trivially already in that day. Journals have paper editions, but nobody consults them anymore. The version that, that people consult and the version that matters is the online version. When the print version disappears and the expenses of the print version disappears is a, is a minor detail in the matters. The ma what matters is that uh, internet made it possible for all of these for all of these articles in journals to be accessible to everyone for free online. And we're not there. We're not there. Well, I mean, and it's been a long time. I mean, uh, for, from my point of view, it's been at least 20 years. And not just 20 years that we don't have open access. Internet became <coughs> available in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. The web became available as of the 90s. So that's, almost, uh, that's over 20 years. And um, we could have had open access even before the web. And we don't have it even now. We should be asking ourselves why, and one hypothesis is that once we got the idea of open access, we started this overreaching. We didn't take what we, we, what we could already get, and we kept on wanting something that was somehow an ideal that was beyond us. I, by the way, to anticipate Cameron's talk, I agree with all of the desiderata of, Cam of Cameron. Everything that he thinks we should have, I also think we should have, and I strongly endorse it. 
but we don't have the prerequisite. And the best can get in the way of the better. If you don't, if you insist on stra straining for the best, you may not notice that you're not getting the better. And the better is 100% global green open access. Now, what's that? First of all, what's access? We're talking about the. <clears throat> I think my next slide is the one that Yeah, we're talking about the two million articles a year, that, or two, or two or three million articles a year that appear in approximately 30,000 peer-reviewed journals. The strict thing, and, and the one that, that should satisfy Nick's uh, requirements, is that there's a hierarchy, a quality <coughs> hierarchy of peer-reviewed journals. That means all of the journals we're talking about are controlled for quality by qualified experts. The trouble is that their quality standards are not all the same. There's, there's the most selective journals that, are, that have the highest standards, and then you go all the way down to journals that are almost vanity press, where they accept almost everything that's submitted. And peer review is really the, the upper part of that pyramid. But in any case, that entire pyramid was available as subscription journals for a century, or, or, or yeah, I'm sure, a century. But the Journal des Savants is even uh, several hundred years old. Um, has been available to those who could afford to subscribe to it. Now, when, when there were few scholars and we were all gentlemen in the world, everybody had access. In fact, it started out with just letters sent between scholars. But once um, uh, science and uh, research reached an industrial scale, journals became <coughs> too expensive. You had too many articles, especially in the days since Maxwell and Pergamon Press. And the result was that those who could afford to subscribe to the journal, those whose institution, we're not talking about individual <coughs> subscriptions, we're talking about institutional subscriptions, those whose institution could afford to subscribe to the journal had access to the journal and its contents, and those who could, didn't, who, couldn't, who, didn't, who couldn't afford to subscribe didn't have access, and let it be said, no institution could afford to subscribe to all, most, or even many of those journals, even Harvard, has said that it can't, it, it's, it's gone, be, Harvard is the richest university in the world. It has the biggest journal budget, and it can't afford most journals anymore either. And for the rest, for, for, this, for this university, or from, from my, the two universities that I belong to, uh, it's just a fraction that we can afford to uh, subscribe to. That means that the majority of potential users do not have access to the research that is being produced. And that's the green apple that we haven't reached for for 20 years now, because the internet made it possible for them to all have access, and we're not providing it. Whose fault is it? It's, the fault is distributed. Obviously, the publishers are trying to stop us by embargoing. I'll talk about that separately. But the scholars themselves, only 60% of journals embargo, but we don't have 60% open access. So at the very least, we should have 60% open access, and we don't. And there's a solution for the 40% who embargo as well. So it's partly the fault of the publishers. It's mostly the fault of the research community. As, as, the, as the old Pogo comic said, we have met the enemy and it's us. We are the enemy. Um, now, access to what? We know that access means you have to be able to, to read it and use it. And that's what not having a subscription deprives you of. People will be talking about other forms of access and open access a little bit later, so will I. But for the time being, let's talk about vanilla ordinary access, which is I want articles that are published, I want to be able to read them, I want to be able to use what they have as results in my, in my own further research. And if I don't have subscription access, I don't have that access. Open access is about that in the first instance. Before we get to fancier kinds of open access, it's about being able to, able to access 28, uh, thousand, uh, the uh, two million articles a year that are published in 28,000 um, peer-reviewed journals. Now, there are other contents, like books, that I'm not going to talk about here. I can discuss it in, in, uh, in discussion. They are not the primary, the first target of the open access movement. They're also <coughs> later in the day. The other thing that will be much discussed here, and there's a special case, is research data. They have different problems. Research data Access is not blocked by publishers. Publishers don't even own it, and God forbid that they should own it. They, they like to. They like to make that the next step. That after they have gold open access, they also get your data. But right now, they, they can't embargo access to the data. But who's embargoing access to the data? This time it's us, and we're not the enemy. The 
researchers are not, by profession, data gatherers. They're, they're scientists and scholars. They, if, uh, they don't simply make a living out of gathering data and then making it accessible to every other scholar and scientist. They take the trouble, and it's often a lot of work, to gather the data. It's often, often not just a matter of like gathering flowers. They have to do things in order to get the data. In order to be able to use the data, exploit it, data mine it, analyze it, etc. And they have a right, having done the work of gathering the, gathering the data, to the first exploitation rights. They're not funded by research funders in order to gather data, which should then be made accessible to everybody to analyze and use. They should have a first exploitation right. And therefore, the reason why you can't have immediate open access to data, is one of the reasons today, is because researchers don't all want to make their, their uh, data accessible right away. There is a natural embargo built into data access, but not to article access. The moment when I publish my peer-reviewed journal article, I want every user on the planet to be able to use it. And as Nick said, researchers' careers depend on this. They're not being paid in order to gather data and sit in the laboratories and gather data. They're, they're, they're being paid in order to produce uh, scientific and scholarly research results which are then used by other scholars and scientists and, and uh, applied and built upon in further research and in, and in applications that, uh, that are beneficial to the general public. So it's the impact, the uptake and the impact of their research that makes the careers of these researchers. And that's why it's so important for a researcher that not only subscribers should have access to their findings, but every potential user should have some, uh, access to their findings. So journal articles are special, and they're the ones that have to be made accessible primarily and first. Um, so first things first, and I'll keep on using this. Now, let me tell you that once we get to open access, it comes in two degrees or two stages, if you like. Cameron may, in his talk, quote uh, solemnly the Budapest Open Access Initiative. I was one of the co-signers and co-drafters of the Budapest Open Access Initiative, but that was in 2001, and <coughs> we didn't really know what we were doing. There were many things wrapped into that so-called definition of open access which have now been in, unpacked with further experience and further thinking, frankly, we thought about it more, and have been divided into two degrees or two, uh, uh, yeah, two stages of open access. Gratis open access is what I'm talking about. Free online access. That's what we do not have. I want to remind you, once you start overreaching for Libre open access, remind yourself, we don't even have gratis open access. And gratis open access is a prerequisite for Libre open access. Libre Open Access is free online access plus certain reuse rights which were born with the online era. Uh, the, the reason I say certain reuse rights is because there's a whole series of degrees of reuse that you might ask for. The various CC BY licenses uh, show the various degrees that you might ask for. Text mining rights, um, re, uh, republication rights, uh, remixing rights. All of these things are potentially useful reuse rights. And they're more than just gratis open access, they're Libre open access. Now think right away, we don't have gratis open access. Publishers are embargoing gratis open access. Imagine if we were, and we're trying to get it to happen as soon as possible. Imagine if you were uh, demanding from publishers, subscription publishers, that 60% of which say you can give immediate gratis green open access if you like. Publishers don't. Uh, our researchers are not doing it unless they're mandated, but 60% of publishers say, of journals say that you can do it. Imagine if you say, what I, oh, no, no, what I mean by open access is not gratis open access, it's Libre open access, which means from the moment that you make it Libre open access, any other publisher, and anybody can immediately um, uh, resell it and maybe sell it for half the price that the, that the original publisher is selling it for. So Libre open access is tremendously against the interests of subscription publishers. And these subscription publishers aren't even, 40% of them are not even granting the right to, to provide gratis open access. So it's definitely overreaching to demand leave. Now, so my focus is on gratis open access. And gratis open access can be um, provided in two different ways. It can be provided by the author or by the publisher. If it's provided by the publisher, it's gold open access. That's what Nick was talking about. And by the way, <coughs> gratis sounds like a contradiction there. Uh, it wasn't quite accurate, but, but I, I could state the 
statistics, but they're misleading. What Peter Suber and perhaps Cameron also says, whenever anybody says that you have to pay for gold open access, is that that's not true. That the majority, and this is what, what I'm about to say is true, the majority of open access journals are not journals that you have to pay. Many of them are subscription journals that simply offer their online version free, free for all, and some of them are subsidized journals that offer, offer everything free for all. So it is true that it's only a minority of gold open access journals for which you have to pay. However, and Cameron will say this as well, and rightly so, it's the top slice of that uh, of the golden open access journals that are charging the uh, the, uh, the the um, the fees. The ones that everybody, um, Cameron's two um, flagship journals, Bi Applaus Biology and Applaus. Um, uh, medicine, which are really absolutely the top of the hierarchy of peer review quality. They do charge, and they have to charge because they have expenses. And there you have to pay uh, 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 open access publishing fees. And Nick said this correctly as well. In a, the, and this is, this is the reason that all gold open access fees, whether they're 700 pounds or th uh, three, $700 uh, or $3,000, or as Nature said, $20,000 if you, if you had to pay Nature, $20,000 per article published. No matter what the fee is, it's all fool's gold because today uh, what you pay for gold open access is double payment. While most journals, just as most gold open access journals are not paid for, that they're not, they're, you don't have to pay for gold open access, in the same way most journals, of which gold open access journals are just a small fraction, most journals are subscription journals. And Subscription journals are where you get your incoming content. Gold open access content is outgoing content. If you pay for gold open access, then you're double paying your institution. Now, I don't think of it as coming out of authors' pockets. It's coming out of funders' pockets and out of institutional pockets. But it's double payment because they have to continue paying for subscription, incoming subscriptions. They cancel, can't cancel <coughs> incoming subscriptions until all those articles are accessible open access. So you have to keep on subscribing to incoming subscriptions, and on top of which you can't afford, even Harvard can't afford, on top of that, you have to pay gold open access fees. So that's double payment. It's payment for incoming content and, and paying for outgoing content, and we can't afford it. And therefore, that's fool's gold today. Not only that, but it's also overpriced and unnecessary. That's fool's gold. The other way to provide open access is for the author to provide it via the green road. Where do these words green and gold come from? In, in the same people who, who brought you open access, as it was defined by, uh, by the open access, the Budapest Open Access Initiative, three years later, in a many, many author paper, we also proposed green and gold because people were mixing it up. They were mixing open access up with open access journals. Whenever they said open access, they were talking about open access publishing. The green road is not open access publishing. It's Publishing wherever you like, whether it's in a subscription journal or a gold journal, but making the final peer-reviewed uh, draft accessible free-for-all in a repository. And according to my um, practical and logical preference, it's an institutional repository and not a central repository. Central repositories, with all of this interoperability, which is very important, central repositories can harvest from institutional repositories. There's no need for an author at an institution to deposit in 27 different repositories, depending on the discipline, depending on the funder, etc. And for the institution to be scratching its head as to what its own output is. The institutions can mandate that their own output is deposited in their own institutional repository, and then if they're, if they're uh, uh, central and disciplinary and subject and national <coughs> repositories, they can be harvested, imported, or exported very easily. One locus of deposit, and the locus of deposit should also be the locus of the provision, the universal provider of all of this content is the institutions and universities. It's in their repositories that it should be deposited. So what's deposited is anything after the peer-reviewed version is accepted. The, the default version that should be deposited is the author's final peer-reviewed draft. If the uh, publisher says you can publish the the, um, and you can uh, deposit the publisher's um, proprietary version of record, the PDF, you can if you want, but at the, it should be at least the peer-reviewed final draft. The way it works is that first you uh, do the research, uh, I don't know if you can see this, you do the research, the, uh, you see, yeah. uh, then you, um, you submit it to the journal, 
the, the, uh, the article is peer reviewed, it may go through several, uh, several um, rounds of refereeing, and then finally it's made accessible to those who can afford to subscribe to it. But if you put another version of it, if you put the final draft into your institutional repository when it's accepted, then it becomes ex uh, accessible to everybody online. I remind you, what we're talking about online access. Open access doesn't mean that paper journal publishers print on paper should give it away on the, on the street corners. Paper costs money and it should be paid for. But the online version should be free for all. Um, now, the repositories already exist. The problem isn't that the institutions don't have repositories. The problem is that most of them are empty or near empty. The, uh, the uh, by discipline by discipline. The, the, uh, the, uh, Average level is below 40% of open access, and in some disciplines, well below 40%. The gold road is, of course, journals giving the, the, the journals giving away the content. But if you look at the curves for the growth of gold open access, which requires well, I've already given you the reason why they're not growing quickly. Most journals are subscription journals, not open access journals. And of the open access journals, they charge a, a fee, which is unaffordable. If the subscriptions are unaffordable, then subscriptions plus gold open access is un unaffordable. So the projected time when all journals will become gold, fool's gold open access is very far in the future. On the other hand, if you look, and here Nick's figures are in fact correct for institutional repositories. If you compare unmandated deposit rates, uh, green open access rates, which are uh, somewhere between 20% and 40%, and mandated deposit rates, it's three times as high, and it's even higher for the older mandates. So you approach, uh, the, the best mandate we have now is the University of Liege, and they're well over 80% and well on the way towards 100% open access. That's what we need. We have mandates. There, the ROAR map lists the uh, uh, open access mandates that exist, but there aren't enough of them. There's only about, uh, there's uh, perhaps 250 uh, institutional mandates and maybe uh, close to 100. Uh, how, do I have 20, 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. Um, but, so uh, close to 100 um, uh, funder mandates. Europe is doing very well, and soon the United States will do, be doing well as well. But they're not optimal mandates. Just like journals come in a hierarchy, mandates come in a hierarchy. There are stronger mandates and weaker mandates, and some are more successful than others. And I'm going to describe you, to describe to you what I think is the most. If you're interested in open science and you're frustrated that I'm not talking about open science, tell yourself what you need is open access, and the way to get open access is to mandate it. Mandate gratis green open access, and the way to mandate gratis green open access is to adopt the optimal mandate and not a weak mandate. Because if we adopt a weak mandate, we're going to be going as slowly as the gold is, uh, and we're going to be waiting for decades before we reach open access. The optimal mandate works within a few years. And it's the optimal mandate I want to describe to you. The current situation, as I said, is that institutional funds are locked in subscriptions, so gold costs even more. Here is the transition scenario. I, the, this is not uh, easy to read. And you can ask me about this in detail afterwards, but I'm going to quickly trot through it. The idea is the institutions and funders around the world adopt the optimal green gratis open access mandate today. If it's the optimal mandate, and I'll tell you which one the optimal mandate is in a moment, green open access will be there within a few years. All of the uh, two million articles per year published in the 28,000 journals will be, will be green open access. That means the, fine, the author's uh, peer-reviewed final draft will be accessible to everyone. If you don't have a subscription, you always have access to the peer-reviewed draft anyway. It's likely to happen next. And the reason that publishers are imposing embargoes, there's no question that the reason they're embargoing it is because of the next step, which is going to be that journals will be canceled. Subscriptions will become unsustainable. And rightly so. Subscriptions have been gone, should have been gone already 20 years ago. Green open access is the first step which will force journals to cut down, get rid of their print version, get rid of their unnecessary costs, and keep only the, it's not that it costs nothing, but keep only the essential costs. Even PLAS is not down to only the essential costs. PLAS is still thinking in the old way that there's more things that publishers should do than the following. There's only one essential service that a post green open access 
peer review journal publisher needs to uh, provide, and that is the management of peer review. We give our articles to publishers for free. We peer review for free. So the peer review is done by us for free. The only thing that the journal has to do is manage that process and manage it by, uh, there has to be a, a competent editor who chooses the referees, who adjudicates the referee reports and, and adjudicates the rev revisions and decides when it has met the standards of the journal. And then it applies a tag. Now you're accepted. And now the green open access version, which is the only one that we need, the green open access version in the, in the institutional repository becomes the version of record. Because the only thing that's provided by the journal is the quality control tag. And that costs something. But it doesn't cost anything like what uh, Fool's Gold open access costs now. Journal, uh, journals will, will downsize to just becoming peer review service providers and they'll convert to, gold open, to fair gold open access and the institutions will no longer have to subscribe. They get their windfall savings from having canceled all their journals. And the price of peer review alone will be so small that even for Romanian universities, even for Romanian universities, they'll be able to afford the peer review. And the reason peer review will be so low, it won't be uh, nature and science is $20,000 per, uh, per article, will be because the peer review will be charged not for acceptance, but for peer review. That means the reason the, journal, the nature journal articles cost $20,000 per accepted article is because the, accept, the poor accepted author is paying for the peer review of the 95% of articles that nature rejects. It still has to peer review them but it doesn't accept them. So this will make the, not only will it uh, make the peer review uh, payment for the, for the service rendered, which is just the peer review, but it'll also discourage what a lot of authors do now. They, they'll, they subscribe, they'll submit to Nature and Science and Plaus Biology first, see if they can get through. If they can't, they'll use the referee reports, which they get in order to fix their article so they can submit it to the next tier journal and the next tier journal until they finally hit the right level. That kind of waste will be over, and good riddance. Now, uh, the University of Liege has the op optimal mandate. It's now over 83%. The optimal mandate, and, and this is, I, I won't even show you, it's, it's, it's achieving almost 100% in every domain. The optimal mandate is the following. The optimal mandate should require immediate deposit upon acceptance for publication. The bad mandate say, Deposit when your publisher's embargo is finished. That's a mistake. You can deposit immediately. Now, um, how to put this delicately, this is being videotaped. I won't say it by usual. We can put it off record. Uh, no, you can, you can, you can keep, leave it on record. I just pretend to care. Um, the intelligent authors will make their deposit. They'll deposit it immediately because they're required to. They will make it open access immediately. Gratis, green open access. The timid, I won't, won't the, uh, the uh, reverse of intelligent is timid, I won't say it's stupid, I didn't say that. Uh, the timid authors will, um, will uh, embargo it, in other words, they'll deposit it right away, but they'll make it closed access instead of open access. No problem. Even though it's closed access, uh, uh, Nick mentioned the solution, it was already known before, but internet has made it trivial, this is called almost open access. Each of these repositories has a button. And when you reach an, a closed access article, which has been deposited, and you can see its title, it's like, it's like uh, coitus interruptus. You know, you see the article, you can see the resume, but you, you cannot, uh, uh, whatever, ejaculate. Um, all you have to do is press the button. The button, one click, and the button sends an, an immediate email message to the author which says, I would like a copy of this for research purposes. The author just has to click once in the email, and the repository sends the content out. It's just a request, a, a, a reprint request requested and fulfilled. So 60% of articles that are deposited immediately in repositories because it's mandatory can be made open access immediately. And for the, for the 40% that the timid authors make closed access, the button takes care of it. 60% immediate open access and 40% almost open access will be sufficient to cause the collapse of journal subscriptions eventually as well. It'll take longer than if it was all open access, but in the meanwhile, we will have 100% green open access. In other words, the primary mission of open access will be fulfilled. Everybody will have access.
to every, all of the 28 uh, articles, uh, to, to 28,000 articles. The other essential component of the optimal mandate is that it should be tagged. Do I still have a minute? Or am I finished? What? One minute, I think. Uh, it should be tagged to evaluation. The reason the Liège mandate is so successful, and the reason the UK mandate will be successful as well, because of Hefke, is that um, immediate deposit will become a condition for research evaluation. The way to get your article, uh, uh, submit your article for research evaluation and performance evaluation is to deposit it in the institutional repository immediately. And that is the one that made Liege's mandate the most successful one, and it's now being emulated by many other um, uh, universities. So the priorities are first mandate green open, a green, gratis green open access globally, then convert to Libre Fair Gold OA, and then open science with LEAD. Uh, the, the article by, I strongly recommend Houghton and Swan's article on the economics of this, I have no time to discuss it, but it saves money uh, according to all calculations. Thank you very much.